Um, so yeah, good evening everyone. It's lovely to be back. Um, it was really touching actually. I was reading the, the comments just before we started. Um, there's a few people sort of gave me a little shout out and that does mean a lot, you know, that I'm building um, a little series here um, and appreciate, you know, giving up your time at this time uh, in the week. It really does mean a lot. Um, so <clears throat> this is kind of, you know, as you know, I, I try and make a bit of a, a series that builds on each other. Um, I'd say this is the closest I've ever come to a direct sequel. Um, last week or last session, whenever it was, um, we'd spoke specifically about kind of psychiatric uh, psychosis, um, trying to lay out some of the differences. Um, and tonight we'll be looking a, at organic psychosis in a little bit more detail. Um, for those of you that haven't seen me before, I, I will keep this brief, but I've done a few kind of uh, topics on mental health with CPD me and Andrew. Um, I'm a mental health nurse by background, about 10 years qualified. Um, I'm also an ACP. Uh, my sort of my day job at the minute, I'm a senior lecturer um, in mental health nursing, um, and I also do a little bit of expert witness uh, work on the side. Um, so I do like to think I know my stuff when it comes to, you know, mental health and 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 these top topics that I get quite passionate about. Um, I'll start with just a very very quick recap of the previous session. Um, and then we're going to take a bit of a deep dive at organic psychosis um, or what some of you may be labeling kind of bizarre behavior. We'll be unpicking what that actually means. Um, I'll be a little bit critical of that as a descriptor. Um, and we'll be looking at various, uh, various different causes of organic psychosis, behavioral disturbance. Um, we'll be taking a bit of a deep dive into delirium. Um, and then we'll end with some questions. This one might be a wee bit shorter than usual. Normally I go right up to the hour. Um, but yeah, I mean, if there's any questions about this or the last one, how it all links up, you know, we'll, we'll take them at the end. Um, but yeah, really my aims tonight for you guys, hopefully um, you'll develop your confidence in identifying and managing organic behavioral disturbance. Um, hopefully you're going to consolidate that kind of knowledge that I imparted last session on what is a purely psychiatric presentation, how you work out what the difference is, um, and perhaps what are some of the implications if we get this wrong. Because it, it, if it does go wrong and we kind of zoom in on the wrong thing, there can be quite serious patient safety implications with that. And we'll, we'll talk through a few case studies, a few worked examples as we go through. And again, I think I sort of said this last time. I, you know, I, my background is in liaison psychiatry. I think this topic is massively important. Um, you'll find, you know, mental health will always want to get involved in supporting these patients, but there is a limit. There is a remit, remit um, of psychiatry, um, especially when it comes to resolving things like delirium or organic illness. Um, it really does, you know, need a strong case for working together. So again, I think what I'm hoping to do in this is try and build down some of this us v them mentality um, that can sometimes creep into services. Um, and I get it. I think every service is kind of precious over their own resources, referrals, etc. cetera. Um, and I suppose what I want to try and highlight is that perhaps if we are too, um, too strict on defending that, it's ultimately the patient in the middle that kind of suffers. So quick, quick recap. I think the definition of psychosis is really, really important. Um, as we established last time, it isn't actually a diagnosis per se, rather it's a symptom um, that's present in lots and lots of conditions. Um, I think the main thing that we all think about when we think about psychosis is that you know, idea of hallucinations um, and delusions as well. So hallucinations, um, as a little recap, it's kind of like when you experience a stimulus, but it's not actually there. So in the way that you can hear my voice right now is because I'm speaking, you're picking that up through the computer, your brain's processing it. Um, and that's kind of how we experience the world. Um, but someone experiencing hallu a hallucination will experience something that seems very, very real to them, um, but there's no actual source for that. Um, when we talk about delusions, what we're talking about there are kind of falsely held beliefs. Um, and the key part of that is that those beliefs aren't really amenable to change, even when we have strong evidence to kind of contradict or perhaps um, change the mind of a, of a rational person. 
Um, we tend to categorize psychosis as being acute or florid is a word that you might hear, um, or it can be chronic. Now, I think tonight we're probably more going to be thinking about acute cases, um, particularly cases that you might encounter in a hospital um, or even a pre-hospital setting as someone's starting to get unwell, because things like delirium tend to come on super, super quickly. Um, so just reflect a little bit on where you work, what kind of patients you're going to be encountering, and perhaps what your responsibility and role might be when it comes to identifying, detecting, um, and managing these kind of organic conditions. We're leaving schizophrenia behind tonight. We're, we're moving away from the kind of purely psychiatric. But I suppose what I would say is that you can absolutely have both. So, you know, you could well be looking after someone who's got schizophrenia, who then develops a delirium um, or otherwise on top of that. Um, I guess it's important that we don't attribute everything uh, purely to someone's mental health diagnosis. Um, that results in what we call diagnostic overshadowing. Um, I think it's something I've spoken about before, and we'll certainly bring that up in other webinars. But really, that's when you kind of get stuck on someone's psychiatric diagnosis, you know, someone with a long history of anxiety. Um, and what we do is we miss the fact that they're tachycardic and they've actually got a legitimate heart problem um, because we've got that history of anxiety that's really leading us down the wrong path. Um, I'm not going to cover that in huge amounts of detail. As I said, we are moving away from more of these psychiatric um, illnesses. We're now going to be looking at the, the, the more organic flavour um, of people becoming unwell. So that's just a little visual recap of, of some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Um, and if any of this is new to you, do look at my previous uh, session, uh, which will get you right up to speed um, on schizophrenia and psychosis. So, <laughs> cracking on with uh, the bizarre behaviour uh, side of things, it's a phrase that I've got a bit of a mixed relationship with. I think on one hand, um, it, can, it can be useful if we quantify it. I suppose my beef with that as a term, um, reflecting back on my clinical days, I would very often receive referrals that just maybe one, two lines, this person's presented with bizarre behaviour, can you come and see them? And I think, you know, it doesn't matter what your discipline, your background is. I'm sure you'd all agree if you got that into your service, you'd think this is a pretty poor referral. Um, quite often that did not come with a mental state or a risk assessment. And there was a little bit of a culture of kind of referring or dumping, um, even if I want to be blunt about it, kind of problem cases, cases that people didn't know what to do with onto mental health services. Um, and what we found as well, we were quite often used in the general hospital, almost to police bad behaviour. You know, this person's drunk, they've come back, they're shouting at staff, which again, this is intoxication, it's not a mental health problem. And sometimes... If you are bringing in a kind of mental health practitioner to deal with that, it almost puts on that that behavior is a little bit acceptable because there's, you know, there's an implication that is, what well, is this driven by mental health? When actually a lot of the times, if there was no underlying mental health condition, it would be far more appropriate to manage that with behavior contracts or even the police um, if the, the behavior was particularly, you know, antisocial or disruptive. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the worst things is a little bit of a tangent, but one of the worst things I was on the ward, you know, writing up my notes and you're kind of right in the heart of it. You buy the doctor's station, the nurse's station. And there was two colleagues kind of having a discussion. This was on a medical ward and it was clear that they didn't really know what to do. In fact, I think this person was homeless and they were a bit kind of squeamish about discharging them. Um, and I actually heard the doctor say to his colleague, you know, if you put in the referral that they're suicidal, mental health has to come. And I think it was very much implied that this person hadn't um, disclosed that. So all kinds of um, awful ethical implications there. Um, but I think really illustrates the point. You need to make a decent, you know, robust referral, bringing in that mental state and, and qualifying and quantifying what you actually mean with this term bizarre behavior because i think it is it can be tempting to dismiss all kind of someone's a bit odd a bit eccentric a bit unusual and dismiss that as psychiatric when actually what we'll look at tonight is there's dozens and dozens and dozens if not hundreds 
um, of organic factors that really can result in this kind of disturbed, um, disruptive, you know, altered mental state and behaviour. Obviously, the the kind of the anecdote I shared with you very much an extreme of bad practice, you know, in a very small majority. Um, don't want to tar all of my ex colleagues with that because, on the whole, you know, the joint working was wonderful. Um, but I think sometimes, especially if that's coming from a senior person, like a consultant or a matron, um, that kind of culture and tone is not helpful. Um, maybe reflect on your own roles. You know, are you in a position to influence culture and perhaps shape the relationship with mental health services, your working relationship there? Because things can become quite tense, especially, as I said before, when we are kind of arguing or trying to protect our resources and, and thresholds, etc. Like the one thing to remember, um, especially when we are talking about delirium, infection, organic illness, if you are working in a hospital setting, your patients are already at you know dozens, if not hundreds of times, more risk than the general population of developing a delirium because they are unwell enough to warrant a hospital admission. So you've already got a bit of a lit fuse there that may or may not, you know, kind of culminate into an episode of delirium or, or something else. And I think that's why we would sometimes push back a little bit if we got a referral that didn't sound quite right um, and, and maybe the referrer suspected some kind of mental health condition. What we would maybe push back would, would be, well, you know, why are they in? Could there be some organic uh, flavour to this? So suppose, obviously can't be super interactive on here, but just as a little reflection, you know, for those of you on the call, delirium is so common, you know, you're undoubtedly going to um, encounter it if you work in a hospital setting. Um, and you, you're probably also going to encounter it if you're working in the community, especially with elderly people. So I suppose just as a little self-assessment, you know, do you feel that you could define delirium? Um, and what, do you feel that you could be confident um, in the management of delirium, because it's something that, you know, throughout my career, it's something that I found um, complex. Um, and it's something that even very senior, you know, consultants sometimes struggle to, to, to get a handle on, um, because it's a very complex thing. And unlike a lot of illnesses, which has very strict, you know, criteria, symptoms, delirium is so multifaceted, um, there could be multiple overlapping causes of it. Um, and it really can make it quite difficult to get to the bottom of what's going on. Mostly, uh, most definitions pretty much will, will centre around this kind of serious disturbance um, in mental abilities that results in confused thinking um, and reduced awareness of the environment. The start of delirium is usually rapid uh, within hours or a few days. Um, I think that was from uh, an academic paper that I found. Um, and this is, I guess, if you're in the UK, in the UK perspective, this is from the most up-to-date NICE guidelines um, on delirium um, and kind of briefing paper. And you'll see here very much the same. There's a, a big overlap there. Um, you may hear it referred to as acute confusional state. Um, and it's pretty common, certainly in the inpatient setting. Um, and I think the, the main thing that I'm contrasting here is this, this idea of disturbed consciousness, um, reduced levels of arousal, alertness. Those are the main things that are going to point you in the direction of a delirium. Um, and again, it's very much thinking about an acute onset here. So if you've got a patient, if you know them quite well, um, you're probably in a good place um, to identify uh, that they are acting a bit out of character. Um, something that can make delirium hard to identify and manage is that if you've not got a good informant, like a carer or family member, a spouse, um, it can be very difficult to piece together the onset of it because, you know, sometimes when people are in that acute um, delirious state, they may not be able to give a coherent history. Um, so any kind of collateral information, um, it's always so, so helpful in mental health assessments, um, but certainly when you're assessing the elderly around dementia, delirium, etc., cetera, um, where they may be an unreliable historian. Um, delirium tends to be categorized as hypoactive, hyperactive, um, or mixed. 
Now, 100% hyperactive delirium is the first one to get identified. Because if you think about it, if you are working on a very busy ward, you've got someone that's chaotic, that's interfering in other patients' care, that's demanding a lot of attention. Those are the people that's going to get a lot of input, a lot of medication. You're going to make that referral to mental health services. Can you come and sort this person out? They've been very disruptive. So hyperactive delirium tends to get picked up uh, much, much quicker. Um, mixed delirium, a little less common, but that's when you've got that fluctuation. Um, and delirium is already um, a condition which fluctuates a lot um, within the cycle. Um, I think my view on this is that hypoactive delirium is it's just as serious, um, but it's potentially got more um, potential to be dangerous just because it goes undetected for longer. You know, again, thinking about if you're managing a very busy ward, acutely unwell patients, you've got three people that are hyperactive. Who is it that you're not giving the most attention to? It's the little old man or lady sat in the corner who's quietly stewing on a lot of this kind of psychosis and upsetness um, and fluctuation in consciousness. So I think good delirium screening um, is really, really important so that these quiet um, kind of hypoactive patients don't slip through the cracks. Um, <coughs> relatively common. Um, so older people with dementia or a severe illness or a hip fracture um, tend to be at higher risk. Um, the prevalence um, can be as high as 50%. Um, so we're talking a lot of people having surgery will develop a delirium. Um, I think there's an overlap here as well between kind of an ITU psychosis and intensive care unit psychosis. Um, and I think it's easy to understand when you think about it. If you've been, you know, knocked out for whatever reason, sedated, intubated, um, you know, had anaesthetic, painkillers, strong opiates, IV, maybe you've not eaten, you've not drunk, drunk, you've come round, you're in this dark room, you hooked up to a machine. It's almost an alien environment. And if you're already kind of struggling cognitively because you're pumped full of pain medication um, and whatever else, you know, ITU psychosis is very, very um, common. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with a lot of experienced ITU practitioners who were quite adept at dealing with that and kind of been able to manage that to a certain extent um, without too much input um, from psychiatry because something like an ITU psychosis really just has to run its course. Um, obviously, prevalence does tend to rise with age, much more common in older people. Um, but the reports do indicate that we're fairly poor at reporting delirium. Um, and it may well be because we don't have time. Maybe we're not so good at recognising it. Um, but the estimates are that we are underreporting delirium, especially from a hospital inpatient settings. Now, there's quite significant consequences from delirium. I think, you know, reflecting on what I thought it was when I started out as a very junior, you know, hospital working, I thought it was when people just got a little bit funny, you know, maybe they've had a water infection and they've gone a bit, you know, a bit loopy for a day or two, but they've, they've calmed down. Um, but, you know, delirium, especially if untreated and if you've got a lot of comorbidities, a lot of underlying health conditions, really can be quite serious. You know, we're talking longer stays in hospital, longer stays in critical care, um, at higher risk of kind of developing dementia after it. Um, for a lot of people with delirium, they don't always go back to baseline. You know, you might lose, excuse me, a few points of function and um, and if you've already got dementia um, an episode of delirium on top of that really can result in this quite stepwise uh, deterioration <laughs> obviously there's kind of coincidental risks that are associated with a longer term stay in hospital um, such as hospital acquired complications pressure sores infections falls um, but ultimately, you know, people who develop a delirium are at an increase, increased risk of death in that first year um, post episode, which is really quite striking, you know, especially if you've got a relative, a loved one in hospital. It's really something we want to work to avoid um, or minimize as, as much as possible. Um, I thought this was quite nice. Um, it's really aimed at uh, uh, patients and carers. 
Um, but I think it's a really good, you know, quick, easy reference guide, even for practitioners, um, just as a quick, helpful screening tool. Um, so some of the key things that you are going to be looking out for would be a sudden change in behavior. Is there an increased amount of agitation? Um, conversely, on the hypoactive side, they might become more withdrawn. There might be a fluctuation between those two states. Um, and are they hearing or seeing things that aren't there? And this is where we're bringing in that kind of organic psychosis. Um, you know, if you've got someone with no medical history, no psychiatric history, and they're 65, 70, 75, and they present like this, what tends to happen is that people zoom in on the, oh, they're hallucinating, they must be psychiatrically unwell. But I think if you step back and put it together with this, what would be tipping me on to the fact that this is a delirium would be the sudden onset, the lack of history, um, and the kind of sudden change in behavior, which if you remember from last time's session, a kind of purely psychiatric psychosis, that can build up you know, over weeks, months, before it reaches that real florid crisis point. Um, a useful tool, I mean, I don't know if this has made its way across the pond or, or globally, um, maybe worth checking your kind of local pathways, um, but the 4AT tool um, is a really helpful screening tool to help you identify uh, delirium. Um, dead simple to use, you've got four questions, um, very quick to administer. And I think what's interesting, if you look down here, a score of four or above indicates possible delirium. And now what's quite interesting about this is that there's two questions that you can get a four right away. So if they're having kind of abnormal alertness, um, or if it's a very acute change with a fluctuating course, you're already scoring a four. And I think that to me just reinforces the point that I'm making. You know, what we don't tend to see in psychiatric conditions is impaired consciousness or reduced alertness. Um, yes, you might have kind of disturbed behavior that's a bit erratic, um, but that tends to be considered as part of a bigger picture. So definitely, if you can use these kind of screening tools, and even if they're not available, you know, quite easy to adapt, quite easy to do a kind of observational assessment um, on someone's alertness, their ability to pay attention, their basic orientation, you know, date of birth, name, where are you, which hospital, etc. Um, so it's, it's a good tool, this. I would thoroughly recommend it, and it really can help you to sift out, you know, what's delirium, what's psychiatric in origin. Uh, so this uh, pinch me is a helpful way of remembering some of the contributing factors. Um, so pinch me, pain, infection, nutrition, constipation, hydration, medication, and electrolytes. Um, all of these things, you know, all kind of very basic um, considerations. You know, certainly I know we've got nurses, we've got other health professionals, but you know, my background as a nurse, you're thinking about the, those ADLs and they're not particularly sexy. We kind of forget about them sometimes um, to, to keep the basics right. But, you know, is your patient drinking enough? Um, are they going to the toilet? Have you asked them when they last had the bowels open? I think something as basic as a, you know, a, a toilet chart, stool chart, just to monitor that um, and chart the progress can be such a powerful intervention, um, especially diagnostically, it helps you to work out what's going on. But, you know, constipation in elderly, absolutely notorious um, for causing delirium. And again, you know, these basics like nutrition, hydration, um, infection, as I mentioned, if you're unlucky enough to end up in hospital, you're already at increased risk because, you know, certainly these days, um, threshold to get into hospital is so, so high that you do already have to be quite unwell. Um, again, pain, pain medication in particular. Um, I'm always very suspicious um, of any recent medication changes in the elderly. You know, you've got certain things, um, opioids, opiates, um, steroids in particular, um, absolutely notorious for sending, you know, not just elderly people um, into a delirium, but we've seen kind of steroid-induced psychosis. 
Um, so again, I think that one of the underlying golden rules of managing any kind of organic illness is keep things simple. If you've recently changed the variable, maybe reverse that, maybe review that before we start going into all this other you know, investigations and, and thinking about other things. Sometimes it's just about looking at the existing parameters. Um, and again, you know, electrolytes, um, elderly people, very, very sensitive um, to any kind of electrolyte imbalance. So you're thinking about your potassium, your sodium. Um, I know one of the things that we're very sensitive about, um, not a lot of people know unless you work in the industry, um, but antidepressants can actually affect your sodium. Um, they can make you hyponatremic. Um, so we always go very, very slowly when we're introducing antidepressants to the elderly because you've got those additional um, biological uh, factors. You may occasionally see um, the E in pinch me as environment. I don't disagree with it. I think it's more the case that the environment can exacerbate it, um, but I wouldn't say it necessarily causes it. Um, I think the difference to me between environment and all these other things is these are very much about the individual. Um, but absolutely, if you've got someone that's kind of at high risk of developing a delirium, being in a horrible, busy hospital ward environment, beeping, been woken up all through the night for your checks, et cetera, that can absolutely um, <clears throat> exacerbate a delirium. I think as nurses, and I don't know about other healthcare professionals, we can be very process driven um, to the point that we maybe make decisions that aren't actually in our patient's best interest. You know, yes, OBS are important, but I think sometimes just having the autonomy um, and maybe having that team decision to say, look, this guy, hyperactive de delirium, he's been up for three days straight. He's finally got his head down tonight. Maybe we just keep an, a, a bit of a distant view rather than waking him up to check his pulse every few hours or go in and disturb him. Sometimes it's about making that judgment call. But sometimes processes and procedures can make us feel a bit disempowered to do that. So do think about your level of decision making. Think about, you know, are you a decision maker? Is this something that you could possibly empower your team to do um, on a kind of case by case basis, of course? Um, I've kind of said that here. I think a few other things that um, are quite notorious for causing delirium, certainly things that I've picked up before, um, alcohol, drug intoxication um, or withdrawal, ITU delirium, which I have mentioned, um, and medication, very, very sensitive, you know, particularly if you're elderly. Um, I, I would encourage anyone who's, you know, interested in this topic to have a look at the NICE guidelines. There's a lot of tips out there on prevention. Probably too much to get into tonight because, as we've just said, you know, there are so many causes um, of delirium that it's actually quite complex to, to prevent it. Um, but there are lots of guidelines out there. One of the things I did want to draw attention to, which, again, was a bit of a source of conflict, is that we know that medics in particular are very, very keen on checking results, checking bloods. You know, parameters are normal now, good to go with a delirium the person can remain a bit delirious, a bit muddled, a bit confused, well after the bloods have come right down. You know, and we quite often got in some fights about that. You know, this patient, they're now medically fit for discharge, um, which is a term um, I'm sure you all love. And, you know, it's something I, I had a bit of a relationship with. And I think there was a bit of a culture of, right, the medically fit for discharge now over to psychiatry. And I think is that going to be in this person's best interest? Yes, they are technically medically fit for discharge, but they're clearly still a wee bit delirious. You know, do we just give them a day or two to rest that out? Or do we go through the rigmarole of assessing them under the Mental Health Act and trying to admit them to a psychiatric hospital when we know that they're going to make a recovery um, in a day or so? Tricky, very tricky. Um, I think, you know, that patient's already in hospital. Let's just wait it out, get them home with care, support, family, etc. Um, I think I've, I've put that in before, just saying that there is that increased risk of, of dementia, etc. That's just taken more directly from the guidelines, but do have a look over that. 
Um, and we covered this in the last session. It's just a helpful little table that can help you pick out, you know, the difference between delirium, dementia and depression. Um, and you can kind of look at the onset, the duration, the activity. Again, just another helpful screening tool um, that you could perhaps use in conjunction with the 4AT. So getting on to some of the things that were, I would strongly consider to be indicative of organic cause. And I've put these ones in red. Well, the top two should be in red. And it just supports what the 4AT was saying. If they've got altered, fluctuating states of consciousness, it's not a psychiatric problem. You know, likewise with alertness, this is really, really taking you towards an organic cause. Um, if it's a very, very acute onset, and the point I was making before, you know, if someone's got 250, 60, 70, and they've got no prior history of a psychotic illness, they're very, very unlikely to develop uh, a psychiatric presentation. I think the difference here is, you know, you can get depression, for example, at any age. But when we're talking about these severe and enduring mental illnesses, like schizophrenia, bipolar, you just don't develop them that late in life. So anything that's new, a bit odd, a bit unusual, probably isn't going to be psychiatric once that person is older. Um, obviously, we've discussed visual hallucinations um, quite quite great detail and um, if that person's got no other symptoms and they're reporting spiders or insects i would be thinking right away about alcohol withdrawal um don't know why don't know why it happens but you know 9.9 .9 times out of 10 if it's kind of that kind of hallucination um i would be suspecting withdrawal um an interesting one if they are aggressive and agitated but they are not responding to antipsychotics or benzos it's probably something weird and wonderful. Um, and I'm going to share an anecdote about that when I get on to the, the next slide. Um, and we'll be discussing some of the pre-existing medical conditions that can tip someone into a bit of, you know, agitated, um, altered uh, states of consciousness. So we're going to go through a few various sources of organic psychosis. I'm not going to get into all of these because it's quite a long list. Um, but it just really helps to show how many um, causes of organic psychosis there can be. So you can develop it after trauma, um, autoimmune disorders. So if you have encountered lupus, that's kind of full body um, inflamed response, encephalitis, um, substance induced. So that can be a drug induced psychosis. It can be poisoning. Um, iatrogenic, which just means harm that's caused by healthcare. Um, so in this case, you know, I've made this point a few times now, steroids, opiates, um, antimalarials, these are all very, very strong drugs um, and they can make someone go, you know, quite unwell. This thing about the space occupying lesions, it can, I want to get back to what I was saying before. If you've got someone that's not responding uh, to uh, antipsychotics or benzos, oh, my cat's come, um, <laughs> you... We had a, a case um, in hospital. This lady, she was really, really disturbed, um, you know, trash in the room. We had to nurse her on a mattress. She was that much of a risk to herself, to staff, destructive. Um, I think we filled her with as much medication as the BNF would let us, and nothing was making a difference. And we just thought, there's something not right here. Um, and it was a full MDT decision. You know, we didn't rush into this lightly, but we effectively had to, you know, sedate her, make a comatose, I think with ketamine or something, um, and get her up to ITU so that they could do, you know, more invasive scans. And it turned out, I think, whether it was the CT, MRI, I don't remember the particulars, but she had this massive space occupying lesion. Um, tumor that was pressing on a part of the brain that really was just fueling this wild behavior, you know, probably on the frontal lobe. And, you know, that tumor was so big with so much pressure that all the drugs in the world were not going to change that presentation. So, again, very rare, but you are working in healthcare. You know, you are going to come across these very rare presentations, and it's going to be these ones that are one in 100, one in a million. If you think about the number of healthcare interactions every single day, you're going to come across, you know, the strange ones. 
Um, a few other things here, you know, vitamin B12, really, really important to screen that in people if you are suspecting dementia. Um, you can reverse that pretty easily, um, and a lot of the memory problems are resolved. Um, HIV, neurosyphilis, really important to screen people um, for sexually transmitted infections, um, especially if they're older. You know, I think we've got a bit of a in England, we're a bit like shy about talking about sex. It's one of my passions that we get better about that. You know, we've nursed a lady who was really quite um, psychotic. We didn't know what was going on. Is it dementia? Is it delirium? And it turned out she had tertiary syphilis um, that had lain dormant, turned into neurosyphilis in her 70s um, and was really like this aggressive form of dementia, disturbed behaviour. But I think if you've got a little old lady sat in front of you, you may be not wanting to ask them, you know, what's your sexual history? How many partners have you had? Because you think, oh, she's like my granny. But we need to, you know, just acknowledge the fact that everyone's got a sexual past um, and elderly people are sexually active as well. So it was in the end when we screened her and got that positive for, for syphilis um, that we were able to get the right treatment in place. Um, thyroid, I've spoke about before, um, you know, hyperthyroidism can look a bit like uh, irritability, mania, hypothyroidism can look a bit like depression. So if you know someone, they've got thyroid problems, before we start inventing all these psychiatric referrals and conditions, get those parameters sorted first. Um, a good article, again, I'm not going to go through every one, it's just more detail um, about some of the approaches to investigation. It just shows you some of the things that can manifest a bit like um, a psychiatric problem. But there's all sorts of things through to the endocrine, you know, even diabetes, if that's poorly controlled, um, can result in kind of psychotic symptoms. Um, calcium, I don't know if anyone's ever heard this, it was fairly new to me, um, but this kind of rhyming thing that doctors use to remember it, this idea of stones, bones, groans, thrones, um, psychiatric overtones, um, if people are complaining of those kind of five symptoms, um, they may well have an issue with the calcium, which can sometimes uh, be linked to malignancy. Um, HIV, neurosyphilis, as I've said, um, HIV, we don't tend to see so much of these late stage complications, certainly now that the treatment is much better. Um, but before when kind of progressing to AIDS was much more common, um, you'd get complications through things like the GC virus, which infects opportunistically. Normally it's harmless, exposure to it, our body just fights it off. Um, but if, you are, if you're a person living with HIV, you've obviously got a very suppressed immune system. And if anyone watched It's a Sin um, in the past couple of years, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. There's that really tragic um, episode, that really tragic character um, who dies uh, of that JC virus, um, the progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. I probably butchered that pronunciation. But if you've seen it, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And if you've not, you should go and watch it. Um, again, you know, dementia, delirium, there's a huge overlap there. One makes the other worse and one can kind of, you know, put you at increased risk of the other. Um, nutrition, super important. Um, mentioned B12 as well. Um, thiamine, so, so important. If you're working with people who've got issues with alcohol, um, thiamine deficiency can be become a medical emergency. We are talking, you know, chronic drinking, you know, years and years of alcohol misuse. Um, but chronic thiamine deficiency can develop into what's called Wernicke's encephalopathy, um, and that's a medical emergency. And if you don't treat that, it is reversible if you catch it, but it can actually progress to alcohol dementia, otherwise known as Korsakov's, um, which is irreversible and pretty nasty. Um, the way we spot Wernicke's, I hope that's working, the GIF, um, the telltale sign is this symptom of nystagmus, and that's voluntary movements of the eye, left to right, maybe up and down. Um, you're also going to have a little bit of disorientation, um, and you're going to have an ataxic gait, so they're going to be a bit unsteady on their feet, they're not going to walk properly. Um, you need to treat that right away with thiamine, Pabronex injection, um, and your B, B vitamins, I think it's the vitamin B2 compound. Um, oncology, you know, if you've got cancer, you've got everything going off at once, 
Um, you're probably on very strong drugs that are going to put you at increased risk of becoming psychotic, poorly, disorientated. Um, so really, really good for oncology um, and psychiatry to work together. Um, I've mentioned thyroid. I'm not going to get into that again. But again, it's just about checking the parameters of things that you know about, keeping it simple. Um, this is a decent approach to investigation. You know, depending on your role, you probably do more of an in-depth history um, than other colleagues. Um, but a mental state exam, getting a history from, you know, partner, family, spouse, uh, your basic blood test can tell you a lot, especially things like CRP, um, glucose if they're diabetic, thyroid, B12, folate, calcium, medication review. If you've just given someone a medication and they've gone a bit off then reverse that especially if they're elderly because what you got to remember as well is that a medication that they've tolerated for decades might suddenly become too strong because the kidney starts to decline with age so if their egfr is reducing very very gradually you know it could just be one day they wake up and they're suddenly not tolerating that five ten milligrams of a drug that they've tolerated forever um always try and treat the underlying cause of delirium be patient, let them rest up. Let's not ship them off to psychiatric hospitals just because the CRP is back down to eight. Um, think about your alcohol withdrawal scales. You know, you're definitely going to be wanting to prevent vernicas from developing. Um, get more confident with your STI testing. Um, I'll speak to Andrew about this, but I've got a paper coming out in the British Journal of Nursing about having more kind of sex positive conversations and it may be something that we kind of develop into a webinar for here. Um, and obviously, you know, some of these might well be outside of your scope of practice. You're not going to be able to order an LP or an EEG if you're in the community. It's just about being realistic uh, with the resources that you've got. Um, so again, golden rules, as we sum up, I think it's very tempting to dismiss all bizarre behavior as psychiatric, but if someone's got altered consciousness, they're not alert, they're disorientated, that typically isn't associated with diet, psychiatric illness. Trust mental health services. If we tell you that we don't think this is fully a uh, mental health presentation, we're not trying to trick you, we're not trying to get out of work. Um, we really are just trying to acknowledge the limits uh, of what we're able to help with. And, and wherever possible, we, we love to try and help with delirium, but we do acknowledge that if it is about medication, if it is about nutrition, there's only so much that a consultation service can achieve. <coughs> I mentioned at the start, you know, the bizarre behavior is not going to resolve if the organic cause remains untreated. So think about that poor woman with the space occupying leisure at uh, lesion if we hadn't fully investigated her she could have ended up on a section she could have ended up in a mental health hospital she would never have got better she would have been a risk to herself to others to staff and i, I mean i don't know what's actually happened to her but you know there's a good chance that they had to act on whatever they found fairly urgently and yes that's an extreme example but i think it's no worse than you know, someone with delirium ending up on, on a ward for later life psychiatry and not getting better because we've not addressed a very fundamental thing about their medication, their infection, etc. So there's the patient in the middle. That's always been my priority and my passion. Um, and I hope I've kind of shared that with you and trying to break down that us be them uh, kind of attitude because I know we're all very busy. We've got our own little patch, um, but it's the patients that we're ultimately here for. So I hope this has been helpful. As always, I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and I've got my Twitter handle there as well in case anyone wants to give us a wee follow. Thank you.